I want to say how thrilled I am to be invited to attend this event by the Library of America. I love what you do, and you are so important to the culture of America and its ongoing curation. I just want to say that right away. So I'll speak for a few minutes about my longstanding love for the great Southern writer, Carson McCullers. I was attending Barnard College, studying English literature and theater. I was given an assignment of choosing a person who was no longer alive from the world of the arts and come in the next day dressed as that person and ready to answer questions as though I were on TV. I worked many jobs back then, and one was an assistant librarian, where I put books back on the shelves after they had been borrowed if I wasn't sitting on the floor reading them. So this was in the 1970s, and the wonderful biography of Carson McCullers by Virginia Spencer Carr had just been released. So I was struck by the portrait on the cover it was a tall, boyish girl with blunt cut bangs, a little jacket, a Brooks Brothers shirt with the saddest eyes I had ever seen. So I remembered this image and sought out the book. I had only read one piece of writing by Carson McCullers at that time. It was called Sucker. It was a short story. And it was a story of two boys one seeks the love and friendship of the other one, who treats him badly and calls him sucker. Over the course of the story, the tide turns the other way. I thought it was a great story. I couldn't wait to read more of this guy, Carson McCullers, whoever he was. <laughs> but here she was, here she was, on the cover of this 700-page biography. So I took the book, out of the library and read as much as I could overnight. I picked out a little jacket and then bought a pack of cigarettes and swaggered into class the next morning ready to field questions. So her gin-drinking, smoking, bisexual persona was heady stuff for a 19-year-old. And I ended up writing a half an hour one-woman show with five songs as my senior thesis back in 1981, based on her life and her work. This was way before my first record deal. So this was a project I visited and revisited throughout the decades. The play Carson McCullers Talks About Love came out in 2011. I rewrote the whole thing, and the the final version of the play was called Lover Beloved, and that had its premiere in 2018 in Houston, Texas, and it has now been made into a film directed by Michael Tully in 2019. And I have always found Carson McCullers to be a singularly modern sensibility, regardless of what era I was working in. I love her for her compassion, her empathy, her eye for detail, especially regarding children. And I love her for her unsentimentality. I love her for her prescient, prescient vision of the civil rights era back in 1940 in The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, published when she was only 23 years old. I love her because she was tough and yet so fragile and needy and sometimes cruel in her private life. And we need her work today more than ever. And now I'd like to amuse you, hopefully. Uh, I'm going to pretend that this song is actually a dramatic monologue. And I'm going to um, tell you all about her feelings about other writers of her generation, and especially about Harper Lee. So um, this is meant to be a tribute, and uh, even though Carson McCullers could be very, very shy and very humble, she could also be amazingly, um, she sang her own praises very well. So I'd like to do that for you now. Virginia Woolf, she leaves me cold. I recognize the genius, but 
I'm twice as bold. I have more to say than Hemingway. And Lord knows, compared to Faulkner, I say it in a better way. Graham Greene, he loves me. He loves my poetic sensibility. Catherine Ann Porter might be the best one now, but in about a year, I'm gonna show her how. Yes, I will. I said to Reeves the other day, Proust really is the man. He comforts me in a way no other writer can. The timeless quality of the work, the length is very long. <laughs> Believe me, Marcel Proust goes on and on and on and on for seven volumes. Now, Harper, Harper, Lee, 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 she only wrote that one book. I've written more than three. <laughs> Darling, Tennessee Williams, it's anybody's guess why a streetcar made millions and wedding so much less. I will forever be pondering that one. Oh, Harper, 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 Lee, Lee, Lee. Why do they always compare her to me? To me. Won't even talk about Eudora Welty. As for F. Scott, my sad cafe is greater than his Gatsby. I'm just telling you what someone told me they read because I never look at my reviews. They might give me the big head. Now Truman Capote was hypnotized, mesmerized, because he realized that I knew that he knew that he had plagiarized my cadences. Imagine his surprise. You'll see it in his eyes when I win that Nobel Prize. I shall be humble and, and gracious. Harper. Harper, Harper, Lee, 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 why do they always compare her to me, to me? She always seems to be receiving more than she deserves. Honey, she's poaching on my literary preserves. Yes, from Harper Lee, we have seen and we have heard, and I'd like to kill more than just that mockingbird. <laughs> You know, sometimes I really would. So you just wait until next year. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.